may be seated this morning. Praise God. I don't know. Uh, I was still trying to find out any details about it this morning. I haven't been able to find out anything yet. Uh, but sometimes around 8 o'clock this morning uh, in North Carolina and South Carolina and Tennessee, there was an earthquake of a 5.1 magnitude. You know, there's a scripture in the Bible that says there's going to be earthquakes in diverse places. That means in different places. That means where they've never not been before. And I'm not saying there's not been any there. I'm just saying that's an unusual place for an earthquake to happen. Usually we're used to them happening out on the West Coast. Amen? All these things, all these things is pointing to get our eyes back on the Lord. No man knows the day or the hour and when he returns. And we, we don't know that. But the Bible says we know when we get to the point where we know we better be ready. That's where we're at, folks. We're to the point that we don't know when He's coming. But we know it's close enough. We better get ready. Amen. We better get our bride garments out of the closet and get them on and make sure they don't have any spot or wrinkle. Make sure they've been ironed and ready. Because He's not coming back after a church that are, that is living in sin. And that's why that represents the church. When a wedding garment has on a, a blemish or a glitch, and think about it this morning, you think, if there is one piece of article of clothing that will be looked at more than any other is a bride looking over that dress before she gets ready to get married. Amen? She wants to make sure it's perfect. No, no problems, no difficulties there. Amen? That's the way we should be about serving the Lord. What is He talking about there? He's saying keep yourself to Him. Don't let someone else dirty your dress. Yes, amen. Amen? amen. Is that good preaching? Yes. Keep yourself to Him. Keep yourself pure and holy before the Lord. We're going to look at the Scripture and, and, and this is going off of uh, the first part of last week's service, we're going to finish the message uh, today if possible. But if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Isaiah chapter number 64, verses 1 through 5. Isaiah chapter number 64, verses 1 through 5. One through five. And as you get that, stand to your feet when you have that Scripture so we can read it together. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Brother Jack, when you jumped up like that, I know that some of you in here are old enough to remember this. We used to have Bible drills on Sunday night. You would sit in a pew and they would give Scripture and the first one that would pop up and read the Scripture, they would get, they would win that, that little section there. Anybody remember that? That helped me remember a lot of Scriptures. Amen? Praise God. We're praying for divine visitation, folks. That's what we need in, in, in this church. We can't get it in this world till this church gets it. Amen. Till we get it as a people. Now we read it together. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou would tear the heavens in two, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountain might flow down at the presence, as when the melting fire burneth, the fire causes the water to boil, and to make thy, make, make thy name known to thy adversaries, that the nations may tremble at the presence. One of the other scriptures that I read said, whenever the Lord comes down against His enemy, it's like a heat melting a candle. It just melts. It's out of the way. When thou didst terrible things which we look not for, thou camest down, the mountains slowed down at thy presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear. Neither has the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. For him that waiteth on the Lord. Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness. Those that remember thee in thy ways, behold, thou art wroth, for we all have sinned in those is continuance, and we shall be saved. For we have sinned in those is continuance, and we shall, we shall be saved. Let us pray. Father, 
in the name of Jesus. We love You and we praise You. We bless Your holy name. We glorify You. We ask You to give us hope this morning. Give us help. Give us strength today. Give us an anointing, God, to walk in these last days. And not only to walk here, but to be effective in the Gospel. To be effective as Your child, as Your servant, as Your people, God. We give You praise and glory and honor for it. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Everyone says Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I just want to catch everyone up to speed. If you did take notes last week, you already have this. If you didn't, the first thing that we've got to do whenever we want a visitation from God, we've got to have a biblical basis for our request. Look for something in the Word of God that you can grab your teeth to and not let go. Be like a bulldog. Have that mentality that you're going to get hold of the Word of God and you're not going to let any devil in hell take it from you. Praise God that we're going to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the of the Lord. But we've got to find biblical basis for it. Yeah, yeah. We've got to find biblical truth for it. The second, if we're going to have a visitation from the Lord, we must have a sincere cry from a burdened heart. Is your heart burdened today? How many has been crying a little bit more than they have been in the past years? Your heart is burdened. You must cry out. God hears the heart that is contrite, that is broken, that is burdened. God, so many is in despair. You know what? The church, what used to happen in the church is when bad news would hit the world, the church would hit their knees. Yes, but now we hear bad news and we just pick up the phone and talk about it with everybody else. We're in need of a spiritual, spiritual reconditioning in America. Amen? Let's, let's look at it from our heart and from our life. We must cry out to God with a sincere heart and from a burden, from a sincere heart, a burdened heart, and a sincere cry. Think about it just for a moment. I'm going to ask you this simple question. Can we honestly say that the issues that we're facing just in our country today, how much prayer have we offered up for this nation? We sure enough have dissected her one way or the other. But how many of us have got on our knees and prayed, God, only You can stop what's happening. Only You can change these things. Does this not break anybody's heart? You know, I am so amazed today at the value of what we place on life today. The value of somebody's life. Whether they get shot in the street, whether they're killed by a police officer, whether they die from a sickness in the hospital, I'm amazed at the, at the thick skin of people. Oh, man, that should drive us to our knees. That should make us get on our knees and cry out to God with a heart that is broken for people. Because some of these people will never be repaired spiritually if somebody don't pray for them. They won't find Jesus unless churches begin to get on their knees again for the lost. I think a lot of times, sometimes we get our attention in the wrong place. You know, even our faith, listen to me today, our faith can be misplaced. We can put it in something we shouldn't. Amen? We need to make sure that we're placing things back upon. Listen, and I'm going to say this, and I said this earlier, I think in practice. I know. Don't, don't look at testing. Don't look at testing. Look at deaths. That's all that matters. Don't look at testing. They're never going to get that right. It's always going to be a controversy. But those people that's been put in the ground, they're not coming back. No matter if they got killed by coronavirus directly or whether they were in the hospital for something else and contacted it or whether they died because they could not get the help that they needed. It's still a death by coronavirus no matter how you slice it and dice it. They couldn't get it. We've got people right now. You know what they said right now in Florida what is the most difficult thing? It's not ventilators. It's... Um, Dialysis machines. Because people that's on COVID are having to get dialysis and some of these others, and we don't have enough dialysis machine to meet the need. You know what that's going to cost? You might know what that's going to cost. If we don't get help for it, 
How many of us are drove to our knees? Some of us have got family members that's on dialysis. Or, and, and listen, anything can change in any moment. Cry out to God. Let's quit being a part of all this other stuff and start crying out to the one that can make a difference. The one that has the solution for all things. The, the, fourth, uh, the third thing is this, and we talked about this about our wedding garment. That if we're going to have a divine visitation from God, we need a life of absolute purity. Yes. No sin or disobedience against God. A life of purity. I'm not going to get too much on these, so let me go to the fourth one. Here's where we're going to start today. I kind of got wound up on the other ones a little because I didn't get, didn't get going good. But the fourth thing is this. And this is probably one that has been under attack. And I'm not talking about church or family. I'm, I'm just talking about work, church. Anywhere you interact with people, this next one is going to be panda. It's going to be the, the pinnacle of all things. Four, an atmosphere of love and unity. If I've seen one thing that's happened from everything that we've been seeing, We've seen disharmony, disunity, things that are that's all out of whack. And church, that should never enter into this house. No matter how upset we get, no matter how aggravated that we get, it should not enter into this house. Yes. Because once we enter into this house, God can't enter here if that's here. That's, right. that's why on the day of Pentecost, the Lord sent them in that room and the Holy Spirit come and they were with unity, with one accord. They were in one mind together. It was not that they were with each other, but they were in one accord is what the Bible said. That's right. <clears throat> with means you're part of the, 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 the thing that's going on. But whenever you join in, you're just a participant. The Holy Spirit was what it was all about. When we, when we come into unity and the Lord said, go and pray, He knew they couldn't get in unity together unless they prayed. Isn't that, isn't that awesome to know? We can't get in unity unless we keep praying. Unless we pray not only together, but separately. Amen. We're wanting the visitation of the Lord. We're wanting the outpouring of God's Spirit. But we must have an atmosphere of love and unity. Divine visitation among two or more people is not possible unless there is a, a flow of love and unity. Acts 2 and 4. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And there suddenly came a sound from heaven as of, as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire and it sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. I say right now that as we read that Scripture, that is one of the most powerful Scriptures that we have today. Because the Lord is taking us to a deeper place in Him. And for us to get deeper in Him, we must maintain a love and a unity in this place. You know, I remember we were living in Pace, Florida and um, me and Sister Rhonda just got married and a neighbor that lived next door to us uh, and, and I won't get into all the semantics of it, but anyway, he had went to a, a church that had a um, their some of their theologian ideals was different than ours. And so he had just got saved, and I'd been saved for a long period of time. And uh, I was out at the fence, and he was talking about it, and we were talking, and he brought up immediately that that separation. And listen, folks, there's, there's seemingly some people that just they want to just have some controversy or drama. And I said, oh, 
I said, you know what? I said, let's not, let's not dwell on that. I said, let's me and you dwell on the love of Jesus and what He did for us and the salvation that He's brought to us and the forgiveness of our sins. And he, and he got on board with that because He went through the same process I did. He just had some issues that we were having to work out. But I chose instead of focusing on the bad to find the common ground. Can I ask you this question? Are we not people that can find common ground if we need to? Amen. Amen. I, I've never in my life understood that, that uh, and, and I had friends like this that was, that was in my life, uh, that, that it just seems like that, that they always had to be up in there about something. I thought, ooh, I can't live like that. I need some peace in my life. I'm telling you, folks, you might you might have plenty of peace in your life, but I just don't seem to have enough. Amen. I need more peace. Amen. I need the peace of God just to saturate my life. Just for a moment that I don't feel any worry, doubt, fear. Can somebody say amen? amen. Just the peace of God. Amen. Just, just the peace of God. The divine, see, that's what happens when we get the divine presence of the Lord. When He shows up, we sense His presence. And then it gives us an anointing to live, to walk, to exist, to pray, to believe, to understand that God's promises are yea and amen. Listen, one major reason for divine visitation at the upper room was the fact that they were united. The atmosphere of love and unity. The people were not keeping any malice, no, nor envy, nor bitterness, nor strife. The church today, if we can get back to that, get back to that. Amen. Listen, I have to keep things under the blood daily. Anybody ever? Come on, let's be honest with one another. Amen. You ever lose your temper? How about last time you drove to rescue? <laughs> I'm just telling you, stress. There's stress everywhere. There's stress everywhere. And we've got to make sure that the stress is in my life. And I'm going to give you the perfect example because we lived it out this morning. Right here in front of you. <laughs> the Lord's been showing me some things. And one of the things that He shows me is when there becomes an, an, a response for me to be making back to her, and I'm taking the response that she gives to me, and the response that we're putting back and forth to one another should be love between the husband and the wife. Amen? Amen. But how many notes according to my, what I'm facing at the moment, and according to what she's facing at the moment, when she makes a response to me, I have seen, you might not believe me, but I have seen this to every person that, that has anybody you live in the same house with somebody. There's an immediate response of my heart to either take that to a place of blessing or a place of fighting. It's a decision. You watch. Try it next time. Anybody you live with, when there's a response, you have to make a decision whether I'm going to make this situation better or I'm going to make it worse. And how many knows this? We don't always make it better. <laughs> if my situation over here has been getting out of hand and that comes my way, I'm going to be leaning and, and I'm not telling anybody that, that this is true but I'm telling you, this is the way the devil works. It's almost like that response of where you have the devil sitting on one shoulder and an angel sitting on the other. And you're sitting there trying to make a decision. Spiritually, that, that's happening every time you make that decision. And don't think there isn't demons coming against you to try to make you make the wrong decision. And don't think there's angels and, and the Holy Spirit coming your way to help you to make the right decision. Amen. Lord, if I want unity and love, I'm going to make the right decision. Amen. 
That's just something that, that the Lord's been showing me. And me and her's been, how, how long have we been married? 36. 36? I think been doing better than I thought it was. <laughs> Woo. For 36 years. And right now, in the 36th year, I'm just mature enough to catch it. Amen. Right. <laughs> I agree with it. Amen. Amen. Right. Can I tell you this? Most of us spend our life trying to change everybody else instead of trying to change ourselves. Amen. That's true. That's where we spend our life. When the Lord is saying, if you just pay attention, I'll just show you what you need to do. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Is this good preaching? Can you say amen? Yes, yes. Woo. The church today is no longer experiencing divine visitation because of an absence of love. The members are rising against the leaders. You didn't hear that. The members are rising against their leaders. The leaders are showing bitterness against their members. And even members are relating with suspicions, envy, bitterness, and all kinds of disharmony and disunity. I didn't just describe the world. I described the church. If we're going to experience the power of God and His visitation like the days of the apostles, we need to open up ourselves for the love of God to flow into our heart and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Everyone that's in here, if I preach a message about cigarettes, we can pray and amen and glorify God and we can shout and all those things. Or preach about alcohol or preach about uh, any other number of sins. But can I tell you what the church needs to hear? They don't need to hear about alcohol and, and, and uh, tobacco and all the things of fornication and all those things. They need to hear envy in the heart. They need to hear keeping malice in their heart. We need to hear, be careful not to gossip. Be careful not to backbite. Be careful not to be a busybody. Did you know all those things are sins that I just named? But whenever you start preaching about that, you know what happens? The whole church gets a little quiet. Why? Because we like to hear about things we can amen. We don't like to hear about things that pierce our hearts. Amen? Glory. And just understand this. The less you amen, the better I know I'm doing, so I'm going to keep on plowing. <laughs> cleanses from all unrighteousness. And to be careful that we don't start taking the things that God has said is wrong and we start allowing them back in the church again. We start allowing them. You know what they call that? Compromise. Can anybody just just a quick raise your hand and back down? Does the church look any different today than it did 30 years ago? Looks a lot different. And can I tell you this? Some of the things that we would not have allowed in church 30 years ago are happening on the pulpit today. We need a cleansing, folks. We need the house of God to be taken out of the hands of men and put back in the hands of God. Woo! Woo! That, woo! Ooh, that felt pretty good right there. I said, we need to take the house of God and take it out of the hands of men and put it back in the hands of God again. Amen. I'm just going to go on this just for a second because I just kind of feel like being this way. <laughs> this, is, this is for all the women. Men were in charge. They, they wanted... You ever notice that whenever you see men in charge in the Bible days, the women couldn't do anything, but the men could do everything. You ever see somebody come over from another country and the woman, you can't even see their eyeballs and, and the dudes are walking around in short pants and a tank top? The men made the rules so the women had to suffer. All the things... And I look back over the church and I'm thinking, most of the things that were that were taken 
that people couldn't do in the church affected the women and didn't affect the men. You know what? They were making the decisions and the choices. Well, certainly I'm not going to make no rules that affect me. I'm going to put one out there to make my wife submit to me no matter what. That's the flesh. I don't need that in there because that ain't going to happen. That will destroy, not build up. See, we need unity in the house. We need unity. And listen, folks, it can't happen in here until we get it in each one of our homes. Amen. Amen. Unity. Let me tell you something. A unity between parents and children. A unity between husbands and wives. A unity between brothers and sisters. A unity again. That we fight as hard to do the right thing as we fight to do the wrong thing. Lord, let me fight for the right. Let me fight for the righteousness. Let me fight for justice. Let me fight for your kingdom. Okay, let's move on. Five. We're going to see it as a divine visitation of God. We've got to get back to having a desire to see people come back to God and turn their lives around. We've got to have a desire to see people turned back to God. Whenever we're concerned about turning the heart of people from sin and wickedness, God will be willing to manifest Himself and demonstrate His power. God answered Elijah, and we studied this a couple of weeks back, God answered Elijah by fire because He was willing that the heart of the people be turned to God. He was willing because the heart of the people what they were fighting for on Mount Carmel was the heart of the people. Can I tell you what we're fighting for today in America and in the world? We're fighting for the heart of the people. Heaven and hell. That's what we're fighting for. And until we get a love back for the lost, until we get concerned again with those that are dying and going to hell, we cannot receive a visitation from God because that is His foremost platform and foundation is that the world would be saved. If we do anything other than focusing on that this morning, somewhere in this service, and we're focusing on all aspects of ministry, Lord, let it touch our heart that we are reminded about the suffering of people. We're reminded about the hurting of people. We are the church, folks. We're supposed to be moved by compassion. Moved by compassion. Praise God. Hallelujah. So God, we need that visitation that He can come down that hearts and lives can be turned back to the kingdom of God. You know, the one thing that I see in all that's going on, Lord, just let us turn back to You. Let us turn back to You. Get our eyes back on You, Lord. The things that You told us in Your Word, declaring for us to follow You and to live for You. Help us today, God. Help us today to want to see the lost return back. To see the, the ones that are backslidden return back to the kingdom of God and the ones that have never known God to turn back to Him. <clears throat> and I tell you this, if a church, is, we know that she must bring forth fruit. She must bring forth life. That life is new life today. New life today. I'm telling you, if there's one thing that this should make us more aware of is it's going to take more prayer. It's going to take more living for the Lord than we ever have before. If not only we're just going to exist in this world, but we're going to be a child of God that wants to make an impact An impact in this world. Hallelujah. Lord, turn our eyes back to the to the lost. I don't know about you, 
But if I start looking through the neighborhood, there's more people that don't go to church than there is that does go to church. Did you know there's enough people in these woods out here we could fill every church in Baker and Holt and, and still have people on the outside of churches need to get in? We just got to get our focus back, folks. We just got to get our, our vision back. The vision of the Lord. That God is sending us for a purpose and a plan. That the lost will be reached at any cost. You know, sometimes I think that we have geared our services to minister to the saved. Is that a good statement? We geared our services to the saved. You go into churches today, they remove the altar. We're, we're removing our identity, folks. We need a visitation from God. You better not be removing them. You better be putting them back in. And all that represents is a place where I kneel and have to with the Lord. Hallelujah. That we reach the lost again. The sixth thing is this, and I've got this two more to go. A readiness to give all glory to God. That everything that happens inside of this church, God gets all the glory. Yes. Hallelujah. For you sitting here in the pew today, God gets all the glory. For everything that I testify about, God gets all the glory. Amen. Anybody here ever heard somebody stand up and in a testimony service, instead of hearing somebody testifying about how good God was, they testified about how much they could drink? Take it. They stood up and they testified how much beer and how much alcohol that God had delivered them from. And I'm thinking, don't do that. Hallelujah. Just tell them, God delivered me from that. Don't draw attention to that. I don't want my life to go back to that again. Hallelujah. If I'm going to testify about God, I'm going to bring glory to Him. I'm not talking about what I did. I want to talk about what He did. All I did was accepted His, His salvation, accepted His plan. Listen, once again, getting back in that framework, getting back in that mode, all glory goes to God. God wants to take glory for what He does. He is not willing that any should share in that glory. At any time we desire a divine visitation, God will manifest Himself if we're prepared to return all glory back unto Him. Do we actually know this morning how the glory of God works? It works like this. The only thing that I can offer up God that He will accept and that will be pleasing unto Him is that that God has given to me. So the only thing I can give back to God is that that He gives to me. You understand? It's a reciprocation. In other words, the, the Bible says the heart of man is evil continually. But whenever we get saved, then the Word of God transformed that from a heart of evil into a heart of God. The Word of God changes from the inside out. Amen. All glory goes to Him. He said there will be no flesh to glory in His presence. No flesh. And I'm going to tell you something. I remember as a young Christian and, and God using me around an altar and and, and touching my heart to do something in the service. I remember things that I had to struggle with because the next thing that happens after God uses you is you want to go tell somebody about it. First time I ever gave a message in uh, interpretation of tongues. I want to go tell somebody about it. That's that flesh wanting to kind of rise up. But no, I'm going to give God the glory. He did that. It was nothing I could do. I can't interpret anything without Him. I can't heal anybody without Him. I can't, I can't do anything without Him. 
So how dare me to try to take a little bit of God's glory? Lord, keep me humble. I want to have humility. Listen, it's all right to, to have the gifts of, of, of the Lord. It's all right to even talk about the gifts of the Lord. But make sure you're giving Him all the glory, all the praise. Because listen, folks, that's how we stay in balance. That's how we stay in balance in the Lord. Let's go a little bit further. That's the Scripture for that was 1 Samuel 17, 45 through 50. It talks about where David defeats Goliath because David was ready to return all glory back to God. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to you, what? In the name of David? No, he says, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defiled. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thy head, head from thee. And it goes on down, and we read the Scripture and how God had given them a victory. But listen, it was because that David gave all glory to God. Devil, you've come against me with the things that you've come against me with, but I'm standing because of the Lord. I'm going to tell you something, friend. If it's me standing here by myself without the Lord's help and I've got a target on my back, I'm a dead man. There ain't nothing I can do. But God. But God. You might have a target on your back, but whenever you're serving the Lord, the Lord says, uh-uh, enough is enough. Let me tell you something. The enemy today, he might have... A, a lot of power and he might have a lot of authority but he don't have as much as God. He can take the hand of the wicked and move him out of your way. Let me tell you something. I've been even thinking about some of the things that's been going on just in our church. It ain't over. Things ain't over. Don't, don't think it's over. Amen. God still got to say He's still moving. But God. But God. No matter what happens. But God. The seventh thing is this. Now we must point our faith in expectation that God's coming. Yes. And if I could just go ahead and say this. He's already here. He showed up whenever His people gathered together because He said where two or three are gathered in His name, I will be there in your midst. Amen. Hallelujah. And some in here today, you don't even have to get out of your house to get two or three. You just got to give them to agree together. Amen. Let me tell you, that's why the enemy's fighting so hard against marriages and homes because he knows he knows God set it up that way. Your home might be in disarray right now, but you look up, God's got your back. And He's on your side. Having a faith-filled expectation. Whatsoever is not of faith is not acceptable unto God. Whew, that's a... Whew. Whatsoever is not of faith is not acceptable unto God. We need to demonstrate a faith-filled expectation before we can see the power of God transformed in the way we're preaching and talking and desiring this morning. You see, I'm not talking to people that's never experienced this. I'm talking to people that's lived in it and been brought up in it. Amen? The unbelieving king was having faith that God can deliver Daniel from the lion's den. And God did according to His expectation. Did you hear what just happened? There was an unbelieving king that was having faith that God would deliver Daniel from the lion's den. And God did according to the king's faith. Daniel 6, 19 and 23. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went into haste unto the den of the lions. 
Now listen, and when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent unto his angel and has shut the lion's mouth. That they have not hurt me, for as much as before him innocence was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Then was the king exceeding glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no manner of hurt was found upon him because he believed God. And listen folks, then the king decreed that everyone is to worship the God that Daniel serves. Woo! Don't tell me. When everybody else is saying, quit praying, Daniel. Don't get over there by your window. He's not changing that part. He's praying because he wants God to hear him. And he's going through his prayer ritual or his routine in his house. And the decree is that now he must be put in a lion's den because of his faith. And then how does God turn it all around? Daniel has an audience with everybody there that they've got to worship his God. When before, when before, all it was was a, was a prophet of God that was in his room and he was praying. Didn't know, not, might not everybody knew who Daniel was at that time. But now the king is standing in his favor and saying, now, now, this day, the God Daniel serves. We are going to recognize and honor. Can I tell you today, when you stay faithful, it can change your family. It can change a nation. It can change a city. It can change a world. The king was so glad because he loved Daniel. I'll tell you something, friend. We know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel was brought into Babylon as basically slaves. But somehow or another they raised to the ranks of where God wanted them to be. And in all of it, listen, the same thing happened in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The same thing the king gave honor to God whenever they were not burnt up in the fire. Listen. We must, we must set our focus back on what God is desiring the church to be. Get back to our focus. Back to the lost. Back to the hurting. Back to the poor. Back to the destitute. We as the children of God joining together and standing in faith, standing in faith, believing God's Listen, there's a lot of people today they are needing miracles in their life today. Let me tell you something. The only thing, thing I can do is to go to a miracle working God on their behalf. Amen. That's all we know to do. And what I want us to do as a church, if you'll go ahead and stand with me to your feet right now. We honor God in this house right now. We begin to set our focus back upon the Lord. What's most pressing, folks? What's most difficult? What are you facing as a child of God? What are you facing as a person? What are you facing? Take it to the Lord in prayer right now. Let me tell you something, friend. There's got to be a healing to start someplace. Lord, let it start in me. Amen. Lord, let it start in me. God, to get our focus back upon You. To get our focus back upon the lost. Lord, that if something don't happen, Jesus, there will be more people we know that go to hell than go to heaven. Lord, get our focus back on You. Get our focus back on You. Get our minds fixed back upon You, Lord. The glory of God, the anointing of God, the power of God. 
refreshing, reviving, renewing right now. Lord, I ask you right now. You know, sometimes, and I mentioned this last week, and you know, sometimes doing our first works over helps. Maybe this would be a good time right here for all of us just to say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me of everything and anything. Things that I know about and things that I don't know about today. Forgive me of it, Lord. And help me, God. Help me, Lord, to walk with You. Help me, Lord, to have faith in You. Help me, Lord, to trust in You. Lord Jesus, what the enemy has meant for destruction, You have turned around for life. What the enemy has meant to bring death, Lord, You're going to turn around to bring about a revival, God. Folks, right now, can these bones live? Woo! Hallelujah. Just going to ask you to lift up your hands right now. Just as we close out this service right now, I want us to open up our hearts to the Lord. Father, right now, allow the Holy Spirit, Lord, to purge us, to cleanse us, to wash us, Lord. Lord, make us white as snow. Lord, anything that's not pleasing in our life to You, Lord, right now, cast it as far as the east is from the west. Forgive us of our sins. And Lord, forgive us of our sins, we pray. And Lord, we ask You right now to cast them as far as the east is from the west. That Lord, whenever we open up our eyes, we are free from all sin and all degradation. Lord, lead us away from the sinful pathways and the pathways of wickedness today. That we can find that straight and narrow pathway, God, and follow You. In Jesus' wonderful, precious name, Amen. And Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank You, Jesus. Thank You, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I just want to say one more prayer before you leave this place today. Father, I ask you right now, bless your people. God, to minister to each and every one of their needs. God, the difficulties that they face throughout this next week, God, you said you will make a way that is right. Make a way, Lord, that the things that we do in these last days, God, will honor you. I ask you right now, Jesus, Lord, just to touch our heart, minister. Lord, the doors right now, this next week that we need to go through, Lord, open the doors and give us faith to go through them. Lord, the places and the things that we do not need to go to, Lord, I pray that You would shut the doors of that area of our life. And Lord, we'll begin to recognize the things that are happening inside of our life. Many of those things do not draw us closer to You. They draw us further away from You. And I ask You right now to let us be mindful of You. Lord, to touch our heart and draw us closer to You. I ask You right now, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, to touch our minds that every day Every day, as a church, help us to call out one another's name before the Lord. Help us to call out one another's name before the Lord. That whenever we go out and pray in our own homes, God, that there will be names that are lifted up, our names together. You know, even the ones that are the ones that are here. If we would just lift up everybody's name in this house, think about how many prayers were lifted up for each individual. We're living in that hour. We need those prayers right now. Not only that, we've got older individuals that are, that are passing away, and I was thinking about, Lord, please let us pick those mammals up. Please, God, that we continue on. 
We ask You right now, Lord. I ask You, Lord, to bless the men to be the priest of their homes. God, to bless our homes as individuals, God. Let them be a place of peace today and harmony. We give You praise for it in Jesus' name. Everybody says amen. Amen. And amen. We love You. We appreciate You today. May God richly bless You.